Hey everybody, I'm Randy with Zen Habitats, and this is Dan. Dan is the owner of Real Reptiles. So how are you doing, Dan? I'm doing well, thanks for having me, thanks for coming out today. So Dan, why don't you uh, maybe introduce us to Real Reptiles and what you do in this facility? Sure, so Real Reptiles uh, is a private collection uh, that we've got a wide variety of animals here. Uh, we've worked with uh, Massachusetts to get our permits for some of these species that are otherwise not uh, able to be kept by kind of the normal consumer, uh, but we like to kind of educate the public about the species we have, both breeding, captivity, conservation, uh, and we do, you know, scout tours, uh, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, in different classrooms, we'll do Zoom videos now with COVID, uh, but also would have them come out here when uh, that isn't a problem in the future. We also work with different veterinarians and uh, breeding research facilities uh, across the U.S. and then across the globe. Uh, to help learn more about some of the harder to breed species and try to kind of help better preserve them in captivity and learn more about how we can protect them in the wild. That's awesome. How many reptiles do you have in this facility? Sure, well we've got probably well over 100, uh, at least 50 plus species uh, represented. Um, it kind of ebbs and flows, like we've got a, a lizard back here that's uh, bound to have babies here shortly, so we might be plus five or seven uh, by the end of this video. Um, so uh, we're always kind of working to breed and then we uh, share those uh, with other keepers to make sure that we've got uh, especially the hard to find uh, less common species spread out uh, and not in just one facility. Yeah. You know what, the thing about COVID is you can't see the big smile on my face when I hear that there's more babies on the way. <laughs> uh, but that's awesome, super exciting. Uh, but now I think it's time to give us a tour of the rest of your facility. All right, perfect, let's go. Let's go. Holy smoke, straight up the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dan, tell me about this species. Sure, so this is a, a blue beauty. Uh, she's a rat snake. Um, and they really enjoy kind of all the branches and the, the space. They're a very active species, right? Yeah. Uh, so they're not one that you would want to see in a tub. You want to be able to see it up and exploring um, and kind of really using the space. And, with these four by two by fours, they're great because you can kind of get the, the horizontal but also the vertical space. Uh, and you can see I just woke it up. Uh, so it's gonna kind of go up, it's gonna warm up. Right to the heat source. Exactly. That's awesome. And uh, our heat is a little different than you might see in kind of a home because our ambient is much higher uh, yeah. uh, what you're gonna have at home, right? So yeah. we're at 76, 78, you can see us uh, I'm sweating a little yeah. glossy. Yeah. 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 So, um, that's kind of why you might see some of our lights above, but uh, on the in a house you might see those lights inside. And then down here we've got an albino tegu. Uh, his name is Ghost. Uh, just chilling. Um, the lighting systems on these uh, are specific to their species. Um, the UV light actually, for whatever reason, the program on this one uh, needs to be adjusted. But the heat lamp comes on uh, before the night, the daylight. It's actually supposed to be plugged in the other way. Um, so the, the daylight comes on, and they start moving around, and then the heat comes on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we work on kind of programming each um, setup in, in order to be kind of more towards that species, especially the ones that. Uh, need less light during the winter and more during the summer. We kind of have the, the clock set up on those fixtures in order to schedule them appropriately. All right, Ghost? So you've got an awesome collection of snakes, all different kinds, uh, but these two are fascinating. You've got a tree boa and a tree python. Exactly. So kind of walking through what makes them different. Sure, so we like to have these two next to each other because um, they look so similar, uh, but they're actually pretty far apart. And so you have a student come through or a kid come through and you're trying to teach them about uh, evolution and kind of the variances of uh, how they ad adopted to their environment, right? And they're both tree snakes. One is of, of the boa family, the emerald tree boa uh, from the Amazon. And then we've got a green tree python from uh, Indonesia, New Guinea area, right? And so they look the same because they're kind of curled up in the tree branches of where they come from. Um, but the difference is you might uh, come across is the green tree pythons will lay eggs. 
uh, and the boas will have live birth. So it's a big distinction right there. Oh, okay. um, and so um, they might look normal, uh, the same on the outside, but internally, uh, reproduction, for example, uh, is very good. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm checking out monitors here. What kind of monitors and, and give us a little backstory. Sure, so again, Massachusetts, monitor lizards, other than the Aki, need a permit, all of these have permits. Uh, these are the yellow-headed water monitor. Most big monitors are not something that uh, the, the average pet owner is going to have the room to build something that it's right. right? Uh, and so we are lucky enough to be able to build a facility uh, with a bunch of these enclosures that sit these. And so this is um, Bumblebee and uh, Supergirl. Uh, they're a, a bonded pair, uh, and they have been laying eggs like clockwork for us. Uh, and so we. Um, We'll separate them, we'll, when she nests, we'll pull out the eggs. Uh, we've actually got a batch of eggs in the incubator right over there. there. Um, and and how long do they eat eggs incubate for? Sure, the eggs, so if you're not a patient person, don't breed monitors. Uh, the eggs are typically 180 to 200 days in the incubator. So you kind of like set your calendar reminder and forget about them. Uh, and then uh, you hope for great success. And we've got uh, what looks to be a, a good six in the incubator right now. And she should be uh, ready to lay here in another month or so. Uh, some of the other animals we have here is uh, we've got the monkey tail skinks, which really, both of these setups are monkey tail skinks. They really enjoy the space, the vertical and horizontal space of the 4x2x4s. By by um, we've got a, a female that should be laying here soon, uh, having her baby, so it'll be exciting to have another uh, monkey tail added to the family. Uh, and down here we've got some Cunningham skinks. Uh, a gurney of Cunningham eye. These guys are super cool. Um, very different than the blue tongue skinks that people usually look at in the pet trade for uh, kind of a medium sized, uh, big size skink. Uh, almost like a pine cone, they're pretty prickly. If they wedge themselves between something, they're not getting out. Uh, we've got a few of them. Not all of them are as friendly as this guy, uh, but they're beautiful animals. And they are pretty uh, terrestrial, and so these 16 inches under the 4x2x4 uh, work great for them, and it makes it so that the 4x2x4 uh, is at a good height for me because I'm short. I'm gonna grab one of the smaller ones. Okay, because she's gonna um, uh, she's gonna have a baby here soon, oh. so he's super uh, very protective. Yes, oh, they, oh. they typically live in family groups. A glove for this guy because his uh, claws are just. So sharp. Um, uh. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had you. No, no, I'll watch you. Whoop. There you go. For some of our more arboreal small species, like the pygmy mulga monitor here, uh, we've got in the 2x2x7, two by two by uh, and then the same thing with the, I'm going to murder the name, Gastrophilus carcina, um, the green keel belly lizards. These super active species like the high humidity, like the high heat, uh, and that vertical space, they use all of it. I like that one. <laughs> okay. You don't want to go to the oh, easy like one? So I just go right here to get it? We'll bring it closer. Here. Now do I let it loose? Only when to let it loose. No. <laughs> oh, can the other one have one? Sure. On the needle. Yeah, that one. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that one, he really was ready. Yeah, yeah. He's hungry, I think. That's why he, when I was here, he's coming over to me. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right, perfect. And uh, on this aisle, we've got a little bit of smorgasbord of different things. Uh, the top three here are different types of spiny tail iguanas. Um, smaller species, they don't get very big, uh, not like a green iguana or a rhino iguana, etc. Uh, so they work great in these smaller enclosures. Uh, these ones I like because they eat vegetables and um, greens, and they love raspberries and things like that, so they're fun to interact with. Um, some people have them super social, ours are very flighty at this point still, so we're still working with them. Uh, down here we've got some uh, Chuck Wallace, uh, which are pretty cool. These little guys, uh, ferocious eaters, but only you only have to worry about them if you're lettuce. Uh, they uh, will devour as much lettuce as you put in there. On this side is a variety of different Agurnia species again. It's that family of skinks, uh, lag bearing. Uh, so they, you know, you walk in here like these cages over here. Uh, we've got some females that are pregnant, uh, so we'll expect some babies of them soon. And then the other ones like the Stokesii and the Hosmeri, 
will have babies probably in the springtime or late spring. Uh, and some of these are cool because they live as a group, a uh, family unit type of thing. Uh, and so it's very cool to see the interactions. Uh, and we're starting to roll out these cameras in all the enclosures so that we can kind of document uh, breeding behavior, we can document births, um, and so we can work with other breeders in the U.S. and the States, as well as veterinarians who are tracking gestation periods and things of that nature. Um, we can help provide data backed by kind of recordings uh, to support the facts of their research. What kind of a collection would I have of Zen enclosures if I didn't have one with bearded dragons in it? Um, we saw these at an expo, and my wife is always telling me, you have enough lizards, you have enough snakes, uh, but she saw the red in these bearded dragons uh, and thought they'd be perfect to put in some of our Zen enclosures. Uh, and so we've got uh, a couple of bearded dragons here uh, enjoying their plenty of big upgrade from where they were before. So Dan, another thing, as a Zen guru, um, and for those of you that don't know, our, we have an online customer service group, and our customer service agents, we call them gurus. Uh, so Dan is one of our Zen gurus, and you get a lot of questions uh, that come at you on your shifts, and, and, and people asking questions about the enclosures, but also tips and tricks. And I know after building all of these, you've got it. Just a couple, yes. All right, perfect. <laughs> so I'm gonna walk through some of those right now. Uh, one of the questions as a guru we get often is, um, that people worry about their snake is going to get out of the enclosure, or their gecko is going to get out of the enclosure. So the first tip, one of the tips I have for you is, for how to uh, secure your solid grommet plug. Um, some people are concerned that uh, the tension isn't going to be there if you've got a really um, creative snake or lizard that really wants to get out. Uh, I haven't personally had to deal with that. Um, all of ours have been in and haven't come out with a problem. But you know, that extra peace of mind sometimes is useful. Uh, and so what we came up with was there's these holes uh, where the tension is that usually holds it in place. If you have a wire hanger or a piece of metal, you can actually just stick it through the hole on both sides, and then there's no way that a lizard or a snake is gonna pull that out, and so you can rest easy that the animal is gonna stay safe in your zone. Oh my god, these are so cool and cute. Can you come tell me about them? <laughs> yeah, sure. So these are our um, tortoises. We've got two species in the building. Uh, the top is the Egyptian tortoise. Um, this male here who's uh, trying to get into his food bowl is about adult size, uh, so they're a very small species. And you can see from the substrate, uh, much drier, they don't like the high humidity. Uh, and then down here, these ones are the red foot um, tortoise, and those ones like it a lot more humid, uh, and they do get kind of big uh, football to watermelon size compared to these tiny guys. Uh, but while I have, while I'm in front of this tank, uh, let me talk to you about another tip. One of the tips people ask is, you know, is my lizard or is my snake going to slide the door open? Um, obviously these tiny little tortoises are not going to slide this over and actually we don't have any locks on any of our enclosures uh, because we haven't had that problem, especially as the doors get bigger, they get heavier, the snake's not going to open it. But say you've got like a big ball python or a bow or something in one of these, maybe you could. Um, and so that's where just another piece of hanger. You can see the hanger on the other tips and tricks. Uh, we use hangers a lot because we use the plastic ones now, so we've got a lot of metal ones laying around. Um, but if you bend it in this direction, and we'll take a picture of that for you, um, but you can slide it in the door, in the door, turn it, and now that locks, and you can, now these doors aren't opening, right? And especially with a substrate guard, the snake's not gonna be able to kind of nudge the lock out or get in there. Um, and then when you're ready, you kind of open the door and take it out. Uh, and now you can get through it. So uh, easy to make, inexpensive. Um, you can get the jeweler's locks. You can get the, the handle locks that kind of come out along the edge. But if you've got a little hanger, a uh, piece of metal, that does the job perfectly. So you've had a couple tips and tricks already which really useful, things I actually haven't thought about yet, so thank you for that. Um, we just did a video about attaching lights to the enclosures on the inside, but you've got another tip for us, right? Sure, so I, uh, that video is great and it's perfect, and so the only thing I would uh, add to it is that you can also nowadays get a metal zip tie. So you know any of the online stores or big box uh, stores that have uh, parts and things, 
Um, it comes, and the good thing about this is especially like Euromastics and things that uh, have high heat requirements, uh, I prefer a little bit of uh, peace of mind that the metal isn't going to melt if I accidentally move things around. Right. Uh, and so again, it's just like the zip tie uh, video, but you can use the metal one instead. And I didn't even know they had another one, so this is pretty cool. I think I might be replacing a few of mine. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And also, thank you for this tour. This was awesome. We talked about doing this, I think, for a little over a year. So it's been awesome to come out here and finally check out Rogue Reptiles. Um, I text my wife some pictures. Apparently, we're coming back very soon. Perfect. So hope you're okay with that. Definitely, anytime. Uh, and thank you so much for giving us the tour. Truly appreciate it. Perfect. Make sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. For more information, check us out at zenhabitats.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter right there on the site. You can find us on Facebook, and we have a great fan group available for you. And finally, check us out on Instagram at zenhabitats. Now, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And check out our other videos. We have great videos on frequently asked questions, new products, and assembly instructions.